as a professional athlete, and especially in golf, you cannot do the normal things that people your age do. And I'm sure that goes for anyone that's striving to do something, but especially, you know, professional sports. You know, I can't just go out and party Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I can't just go out and take a random trip to Disneyland in the middle of the season. You know, I got to go back and see my coach. I got to make this tweak. I got to go work on this. I have to create it live on Fireside. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Athletic Definition. I'm your host, Coach Ray Z, and today my special guest is pro golfer Brittany Fan. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to be here with us. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. And I, I met you through the Mighty Algorithm. It, it showed me you working out, and I was like, okay, I'm going to take a look at your profile and kind of just see what you're all about. And then as I kept looking further. I'm like, I'm going to send her an invite. I actually try to get you here during, uh, I think, w Women's Month or Women's Sports Month. I remember that, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, it was a while ago, but I, I understand. I, I reach out to a lot of people, busy schedule, so I thought I'd follow up with you, and I'm glad you had some free time. And I always like to get started with your childhood was. Was it you were an active child or didn't like sports, video games? Yeah, so my story was a little little different. So I started golf at the age of 12, which is considered late. You know, most people start around the age of six. Um, so before that, I was completely opposite, doing singing, dancing, wanted to go try out for Disney Channel. I was making a CD and all of that. And then one day, I went with my dad to pick up my brother from golf practice. And I was kind of just fooling around on the range, swinging the golf club. His coach walks over, gives me a pointer. And then next thing you know, I'm striping the ball, and I kind of just got hooked from there. So that's how it started. <laughs> okay. So you were looking more into acting and singing and, and that creative aspect. What about any other sports that caught your eye at all when you were younger? Um, I mean, I did track and field for a little bit. And then I was actually, funny enough, about to join cheerleading if golf didn't happen. But yeah, it was just kind of one of those things where I immediately got hooked to the sport. And I know I wanted to get better. And all my time and commitment went to golf. And then from there, did you have the opportunity to play like in high school? Did your high school have a golf team? Yeah, so I played on the high school golf team. And then outside of that, also traveled, you know, to the neighbor islands to play in other tournaments. And then they also have some bigger junior golf tournaments. Um, so I'd fly to the mainland for those. And then that's also, you know, how coaches can basically come and see you and recruit you. And you, you pique interest through those tournaments on the mainland. Actually, yeah, that's one thing I forgot to mention. How was it growing up in, you grew up in Hawaii? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how, how is the golf over there? Like, as far as for local people growing up, they're not for people going, you know, for tourism and taking up the, the golf, like yeah. most people do. Yeah. I'd say golf, baseball, and football are like the three main sports coming out of Hawaii for sure. I mean, you know, it's great for golf in terms of weather, giving you windy conditions, typically tends to be resort style courses, but the fact that I could practice all year round and pretty much have everything I need was great. Um, I'd say the biggest thing though, when you grow up on an island, in order to get better, you have to compete against people that are better than you. One of the reasons why you need to fly to the mainland and compete in bigger tournaments against different competition, because if you keep competing with the same people, you stay at the same level. Um, yeah, but yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> I think that's pretty much in everything. You have to play against better competition to take it to the next level. And as you're uh, playing in high school, at, at what point did you really want to take golf seriously or was it just for fun? Not really. It was kind of, you know, instantly once I got hooked and I started to work really hard at it, I could see myself progress at a really fast rate. And the, you know, the difference is it came from within so it was kind of funny, you know, I don't have my parents over there standing over me saying, you know, you got to practice, you got to do that. So it, it was actually the opposite of that. It was, you know, s sunset every single day. And they're like, uh, are you ready to go? <laughs> so for me, I, you know, it was just wanting to get better. And I guess seeing myself get better at such a fast pace. But of course, you know, putting in the work and the time was just really exciting. And then at what point did you find out? there's a golf uh, where I can play in college and be on the team and where that made, was that a goal in high school already? Or was that something that you realized later on? Yeah, no, that was a goal pretty much when I started golfing. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to play as a division one, 
you know, college golfer. And so I was fortunate enough, you know, to play in big events like Junior World Championship, PGA Championship, and I got a lot of exposure through those tournaments. So when it did come time to pick a college, um, you know, I took a lot of my visits and it really came down to 90% coaches, 10% team. Because what I realized when I was visiting all these different schools is a name is just a name. And in terms of what they can provide, you know, through facilities and academics and all that, it was really similar. But I was looking at a place where I would personally be able to grow and feel that I would be able to get better. And that's why you chose Colorado? Yes. I get that question a lot. Hawaii to Colorado, quite a big change. <laughs> right. That That's what the acclimation of just the weather. Yes. I actually like cold weather despite growing up in perfect, you know, tropical climate. So for me, I was always excited for fall and snow to come. But we also had an indoor facility, and our coach was awesome. She would fly us, you know, to Arizona to kind of knock off some rust before we started our spring season. Um, But we had the facilities necessary. And what is the, I guess, the equivalent to the championship in in, uh, high school for golf? Is there anything that you you strive for? In high school golf, we had our ILH state championships. Um, So that was always a goal at the end of the season. And then in addition to that, when I traveled to the mainland, it would be these bigger tournaments, right? Junior World Championship, PGA Junior Championship, uh, U.S. Amateur. Those were kind of the bigger goals outside of high school. But, yeah. And then I see you all doing a lot of training besides the golf practicing. At what point did you start training like that as well in high school or later on in college? Well, so in high school, I'm obviously, I wasn't as knowledgeable as I am now. Now I'm a lot better in terms of, you know, what I need to do, what works for me and what doesn't. In high school, I did do a lot of working out, but it seemed to be a little bit less weight focused and a little more cardio flexibility, range of motion focused. And then in college, you know, you work with the trainer, uh, they have somebody for the team. I started to kind of research a little bit more into golf fitness. And that's also kind of when TPI, Titleist uh, Performance Institute, kind of became a big thing. So all the college teams started adding that into their program. And I would say now I've got the workouts down. Oh, yeah. I I was going to get into that more. Your, your, Your workouts, just going through your Instagram they seem like to be more specific training for your your event than uh, like going back to the I, I had to go back to figure out, you know, a little bit about your bio and everything. So I went yeah. as far back and I could see the progression of your workouts and how they uh, are being more, I would say, sports specific than just general training. Yeah. And I would say, you know, golf fitness is a big thing now. I mean, we can definitely thank you know, thank Tiger Woods for bringing fitness into the sport. But now you've got all these like, oh, top 100 golf specific trainers. And it's interesting because golf is one of those sports that, you know, it's not like football where you can just be like, okay, I need this person to be at whatever, 40% lean mass muscle, 10% body fat, and they have to sprint, you know, 3.8 seconds on a 40 yard dash. Golf is different because if you notice when you watch all the professionals or even amateurs, you can be a little chunky, a little skinny, you know, in shape, out of shape you see the whole spectrum. So what I've come to realize is, okay, if there's something that I can tr- can control, which for me would be my strength, my flexibility, what I eat, that kind of stuff, I that is something that I should be, you know, trying to be at the top of my game at. So for me personally, and what my trainer does is she kind of mixes in general athleticism, you know, being an athlete mixed with golf specific things. So that would be like a lot of explosive, rotational power, you know, obviously you can put on a little bit of muscle without getting tight. Um, but yeah, it's definitely it's definitely different than it was, you know, eight years ago. <laughs> and how many trainers and coaches do, do you actually have at the moment right now? Um, so we've got, you know, one coach for your – one or two coaches for your golf game, right? That could be your swing coach or short game coach um, in that area. Then you've got your kind of chiropractor PT guy, injuries, maintaining your body's health. And then you've got your trainer. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and do do you find it difficult where maybe they'll be giving you conflict of uh, working out or rest days, anything like that? For the most part, no, because I try to keep all of them on the same page. And if I can't connect them, whether that be through like a group text message or something like that, I feel like everybody's on the same page for the most part. It seems like my range of motion, 
you know, ties into certain workouts, which ties into certain flexibility uh, things. So it works together. <laughs> and then working out backwards a little bit more, did you win anything at any point while, you know, you started kind of liking it? You're like, oh, I got hooked and winning anything that gave you even more confidence? Oh, yeah. I, uh, so it's funny. I was one of those kids where I've now learned graceful losing. Uh, I was extremely competitive when I first started golf, um, as I am now, but you know, obviously I'm a little more mature, <laughs> but no, it was, I was so competitive to the point that when I was playing these local junior golf tournaments in Hawaii, I actually did not want to go up and accept the trophy unless it was first place. Okay. You know, they, give, they give a trophy first, second and third, but you know, it's just that competitiveness. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I can understand. I've, I, I know, I think I used to be way more before like that and I, I've become less like that. Yeah. And I'm just happy to participate. And if I happen to place in anything, to me, it's like a little bonus for me. But yeah. I, I think that it's the mentality that you have when, I don't know, I think it's as you're younger and then as you mature, you, you kind of see in a larger perspective. I, I would also say that something that added, you know, fuel to the fire is because I started so late, I would, you know, Hawaii golf was pretty competitive uh, in my age range. I'd say give or take three years. That was a very competitive time for golfers coming out of Hawaii. And because I started so late, I was behind everybody. Um, so I think I kind of just used those challenges and adversities as motivation. And, you know, the work, yes, it was hard work, but it was also fun at the same time. So for me, I didn't even, it didn't feel like work. Did you realize at the time that, since you're starting at 12, that's late compared to everybody else? Or were you just like, I'm, I'm playing, I like this, I'm, I'm hooked? A little bit of both. You know, you, <laughs> as a kid, you know, they tell you, oh, be more realistic or yada, 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 that kind of stuff. But to me, you know, when somebody tells me that, I kind of take it as a challenge. And I would say that there were some competitors that I did play with and some parents of competitors that I played with that maybe weren't the nicest, you know, to the new girl coming in. Oh, she's a newbie. Oh, she's not that good. But, you know, I basically turned something negative to something positive. So one thing I do remember specifically is when I started out, you know, everybody starts out and they suck. Golf is hard. That's just how it is. Um, I do remember this one instance. I was playing a practice round with a girl that was really good. And her father basically came up to me and said, are you sure you want to play those tees? Maybe you want to move forward and play the front tees, which was so out of line because we're in the same age group and you play from the same tees. So basically it was kind of like an indirect, I don't think you're good enough to play from there and you're not far enough. You know, you don't hit the ball far enough to play from there. Maybe you should move up is kind of what it was, but you know what, that made me so mad. And I was like, screw you and ended up becoming, you know, one of the longest hitters in Hawaii. So it's just, you know, perspective. How do you turn it into something positive? Right, right. It's all about the perspective. And then once you made it to college, how, how was that experience? And did you get a scholarship for golf as well? Yes, I did. I was fortunate to have quite a few options. Um, I pretty much eliminated all the East Coast schools just because I felt like I would be a little homesick and the weather might be a little extreme for me. So I stuck to, you know, Central and West Coast, did my visits, ended up choosing Colorado. And, you know, it was a bit of a transition. And I only say that because my last year and a half of high school, I was actually sitting in class one day in trigonometry class, staring out the window. And I was thinking to myself, man, I could be at the golf course right now. And then a light bulb went off. I could be at the golf course right now. So what I did is I basically, I went to the counselor and the board of directors and the school that I was attending, you have to, you know, be whether it's 1% or 100% Hawaiian, you have to show proof that you have Hawaiian blood and it's a very difficult school to get in. So one of the goals for me was, you know, how can I continue to work on my craft but still be able to get my diploma from this high school? So after talking to the board of directors and my counselor, they presented me with two options as a junior in high school. Basically take the second semester of my junior year off and then come back or take the last year and a half off, but then I wouldn't be able to do things like, you know, go to prom, walking commencement, song contest, which was all like a huge deal for a 16 year old. But for me, the option was pretty easy. So I took my last year and a half off and did homeschooling, which allowed me to practice, you know, from seven to seven, 10 to seven, I could travel with a little bit more flexibility. And I think that's also when my game started getting better and better and better. 
Um, so yeah, that transition from practicing that long, all of a sudden going into a college schedule, it definitely created a little bit of anxiety, I would say, just because, you know, you had the whole day to practice and now you have three hours, but it did teach me something valuable, which I still carry to this day. Initially, when you start your sport or your craft, yes, you need the hours and the work and the reps to put it in. However, I learned how to be productive in a short amount of time. So just because you, you know, go to the golf course and practice for six hours, it doesn't mean anything. I can get the same amount done in half the time if it's productive, quality, focused practice. And so that's what my first, you know, transition from that to college golf taught me. So make sure I understood this. Your senior year, you gave up basically what typical high schoolers do to practice about 12 hours, 10, 12 hours a day? Yeah, my schedule was 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. And then as soon as I felt like I was getting better, I backed it off to 10 a.m. to 7 a.m. So it was pretty much like anyone goes to a job, but mine was at the golf course. And, you know, that included training, of course. But, yeah, got to get the reps in. (laughs) Wow. Now I could see how that will help you from the times kind of starting late in that sport to making it up. And then once you see the progression, then you turn it more into effective training, which is – the smart way to do it. And then in women's team golf, is it you get, everybody plays individually and then it's a combined score or are you guys actually playing as a team where? Yeah. So that's the unique thing about golf. It's two aspects. You've got the team, right? Where you travel together. Usually it's five on a travel team and they take the top four scores. And so you play as a team for that ranking, but then there's also the individual, right? If you play well individually, you can also win the tournament or get your top five or whatnot, but you also help the team. So it's a very unique thing, yeah. And did you win any championships in college? I did. I won one tournament, and I did finish All-American my senior year, which was the goal. I walked in freshman year, and I was like, what is this, like, All-American? At the the end of the season, you know, Pac-12 championships, they were presenting these awards, and I was like, what is this? All-American team, honorable mention, what is is that? And I told myself, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get that. And finally, senior year, you know, after learning everything, from my coaches, through experience, uh, technique-wise, things started clicking in my swing. I was able to finish that goal, which was a really cool experience. And then I read uh, you graduated in advertisement? Yes, I did advertising and business. And business. At what point through your college did you figure out, I want to keep golfing instead of being in an office and, you know, in a little cubicle? I mean, so since I started golf, I already knew that I wanted to turn professional. Okay. Challenge with college was how can I find something that, you know, interests me in my studies, but at the same time doesn't kill me with, you know, the workload and the exams and having to be here for this class because golf, you miss a lot of school. Um, so I found a perfect match between advertising and business. And that's also something that, you know, is broad enough that can be applied after school whether it be to golf or other aspects if you decide to retire, but yeah. Yeah, I can definitely see it, especially since you decided to create a logo for yourself, which I like it. Your your name is Brittany Fan, and I'm like, that's a cool name, first of all. And then you came up with a Be Fantastic. It's funny because everybody, yeah, a lot of people like it. It's literally my college nickname. So nobody would actually call me by my real name. It was always Be Fantastic. And even at tournaments now, what's up, Be Fantastic? What's up, B-Fan? I mean, nobody says my actual name, which is fine. I mean, I like my uh, nickname. But it's crazy because what happened is I was talking to my uncle about this, and he was actually sipping a glass of whiskey one night just scribbling on a napkin. And, you know, he went to his artist friend, and we kind of just, you know, tweaked it a little bit over time, but we came up with this uh, B-Fantastic logo. All right. So if you weren't golfing, would you? could you see yourself working in business and advertisement now? I could. I I almost thought about that because people ask like, oh, when you retire golf, what are you going to do? You know, I've been told I would be good for TV, real estate, something with selling, marketing, that kind of stuff. But honestly, I also have a passion for skin. So I feel like if I did not know that I wanted to play golf, I probably would have studied dermatology. Mm, Okay. But there's so many, I mean, golf has opened so many doors and so many opportunities that for me, I've met a lot of people. So, you know, when that time comes that I do decide to retire, there's so many directions to go in. 
has coaching ever crossed your mind as far as passing on the knowledge that you've acquired and all the experience? Yes. Yes, it has. Um, it's funny because, you know, my college coach kind of told me like, hey, if you are ever, you know, done golfing or you feel like you're ready to move on to the next chapter of your life, there'll always be a spot here for you, which is basically the, her indirect way of saying, you know, I'd really love to have you back here coaching whenever you're done if you want to. But yeah, I mean... <laughs> That it's great to have those type of opportunities, and especially if it's something that you love and you enjoy. And then you graduated from college. After you graduated, that you achieved your goal of becoming pro, or was it while you were in college? Oh no, it was months after. So you have to stay amateur to play in college, and then once you graduate, you can stay amateur for. I think I stayed amateur for maybe like two months, and then I played the last tournament as an amateur, turned pro, and then from there you can start winning money and doing all these other things that you couldn't in college. So is it basically it's because of the regulations of athletes can't make money while you can't turn pro? Yeah, I know that rule has changed recently because now you oh, that's right, mm -hmm. right uh, from companies and stuff. Yeah, but they had they were always changing, you know, the hundreds of rules that they had. But yes, you have to remain, I believe, amateur status to play in college. Is there any other criteria or to become a pro besides? you know, being done with college, like could a happy Gilmore just go up and be like, Hey, I want to turn pro. Yeah. A lot of people do. And you'll see a lot of people leaving college early now to turn pro. Um, you basically just have to declare it. I'm trying to remember exactly how I did it. I, there's, there is a little bit of a process, but yeah, you declare that you're pro and it's, it's, it's difficult to change your status from pro back to amateur, but it can be done. Um, okay. so yeah, but of course, you know, when you go and you play Q school and all these tournaments and stuff, there is a little bit of an expectation as a pro. So I don't know if, you know, Joe shooting 90 over there can just step up and turn pro. He might need to practice a little bit first, but he could if he wanted to. <laughs> okay. And that, that'd be pretty funny if someone could do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> once you became pro, how long did it take you to win your first tournament? Not that long, actually. What I did is, so there was a mini tour called the Cactus Tour out here in um, Arizona, and they play a couple tournaments in California, but they were playing a practice run tournament for stage one of qualifying school, which was in August. And so I graduated in May. I think I stayed amateur for June, turned pro in July, and then won the tournament in August. Was that really satisfying since you had that goal since being 12 years old when you yeah. Do you have a pinnacle of your career or would that be considered one of them? I, I would say for sure. It's definitely a transition when you go from college to pro and same thing, junior golf to college golf, college golf to pro each step you think you're good, but you have to get better because there's always somebody out there that is better than you. And you have to keep progressing. Even if it's the smallest details that make the biggest difference. Um, I would say yes. I felt like I had great momentum coming out of college, a lot of confidence, golf game felt sharp. Um, and yeah, a great practice run for stage one. So, <laughs> it always helps. And I'm sorry, what was the last part? I said it always helps when you win a tournament or you're playing well, the momentum moving into the next event. Oh, of course, of course. And then what is a typical day for a pro like now? Do you, how many hours are you actually golfing now? And I also see you doing a lot of training. So how much of your time is dedicated to training off the actual golf course? Yeah. So, okay. I'll give you an example day. So, you know, in the season is a little bit different when you're traveling and playing tournaments. Typically I'll get to a tournament three to four days before round one. Um, and it's usually flying in given the location of the tournaments. So you get there, you give yourself three solid days of practice. That's when you do like your prep work, your practice rounds on the golf course. You can do a light workout in there, but it's mostly, you know, in the season, you're not really lifting a ton of heavy weights. It's more maintenance and just making sure that you don't get injured and range of motion, keeping the body in shape, especially on all the, you know, the, the plane rides and the car rides, they're long. So your body does get tight. And then you play three to four rounds of tournament golf. And depending how many weeks you do in a row, you could go six weeks in a row, four weeks in a row, take a week off here. So you kind of design your schedule how you need to. But typically, you're playing two to four tournaments a month. I mean, which is kind of crazy. I'm gone half the time in the summer. Well, how long is your season? Uh, our season usually starts March and runs until about kind of mid-end of November. 
Oh, okay. That so yeah, that takes up pretty much the whole time. And then I know. So you're saying you kind of do light, lighter workouts when it's not the season. Are are you training more, a oh, yeah. little bit more than that, like typical? Yeah. So for the off season, basically, I'll wake up in the morning. I'll get my mor- morning workout done, which is typically like an hour and a half to two hours, depending on what I'm doing, and then come back, shower, eat breakfast. If I need to do a couple errands or need to do a couple other things, I'll do that before I had to practice. And you pretty much practice all afternoon until sunset. And then dinner, eat, sleep, repeat. <laughs> Have you had any uh, major injuries uh, that you've had to overcome in, in golf? I have been fortunate to not have any major, major injuries. I do have the occasional, you know, like the wrist, the thumb hurts. Oh, my foot hurts. The back gets a little tight. But I think one of the main reasons why I don't have any major, you know, I didn't have to get surgery or cortisone shot or anything like that yet is partly due to the fact that I've been doing yoga since 12. And then also I try to stay on top of it with the chiropractor and the PT and stretching. And, you know, recovery is just as important as working out, right? You can work out and be strong, but if your form is wrong or you get too tight and, you know, how does that help you in your sport? So I think balancing both. And recently, I just got into food a little bit more. I'm, I'm still trying to, you know, learn more, but I've been talking to my chiropractor slash PT guy, and he's really big on food. So what I'm doing now is he suggested doing kind of like a Tom Brady diet, but I'd say general knowledge, you know, dairy and grains, gluten, that kind of, you know, slows down the healing process, creates unnecessary inflammation. So I am working on transitioning that into the diet now, which is pretty difficult. And and especially more traveling, I would assume. Yes. It is so hard to stick to a routine when you're on the road. (laughs) And then what about, do you feel that the jet lag or anything like that affects your your play when, or because you have a few days before it, does it give you time to acclimate to it? Oh yeah. That's exactly why you get to events a couple days before. I always expect the day that I get in and the next day to kind of just be a little, a little weird, you know, maybe not as sharp, not at the top of my game. I might be a little tight, might be a little tired. Maybe my timing is off that week, but you know, the next couple of days when you are getting back into sync and adjusting to the time zone, it's, it progressively gets better and it's noticeable too. Do all the courses you play on actually have fans that follow you from hole to hole or are some of them because i read on one of your posts saying that i think the idaho course is one of the most beautiful one you really enjoy it because you can hear the nature yes um there are certain tournaments where there's more people that come out than others some of the locations are kind of in the boonies (laughs) so it is a little bit hard for people to travel out there but in the more you know in the spots where people can travel to you will see people and and it's crazy because i've even had people who I've never met before, but they follow me on social media and they drove and they come out and they watch the tournament. And to me, that's so awesome. And then, you know, you get to meet them on the side after, you know, take pictures, give them golf balls, just have a chat with them, you know, face to face. So it's pretty fun. I enjoy it when there's fans out there. We have had a little bit of extreme weather this year, so that might have affected (laughs) a little bit of that. During the pandemic, how how did that affect your training? Did that uh, pretty much stop it or was that easy for you to deal with since maybe a lot of golf is kind of solo where you could just work on your you know your 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 swings that's what you would think it's kind of like a year and a half of nothing it's just nothing happened i know that they it was it so i was in arizona when it started to get crazy and i actually flew back to hawaii for a year and a half i just moved back to arizona this january and everything was kind of shut down there so no i didn't have access to a golf course for a couple months it was me chipping in the yard and trying to just swing into a net and uh, putt on the carpet and just figure something out until things started to open up again. But it was kind of crazy because we didn't know whether we were going to have a season or not. We just, I mean, every nobody really knew what was going on. And so they eventually did have some tournaments, but it was kind of like a play at your own risk and you don't have to play if you don't want to. It really was like a year that just went by and nothing happened. <laughs> And you also mentioned that rest is very important, and I, I agree. But certain people that are competitive and high-strung a little bit and have dreams since they were a child to find it difficult to take any time off, how difficult is it for you to actually take time off and let your body recover? 
that's funny that you say that because I was literally just having this conversation with my mom. I'm always used to going, going, going and doing things. So for me, you know, I give myself an off day once a week just so you don't get burnt out and you kind of stay refreshed. But it is so hard um, to just not do anything. <laughs> when I have those me days, sometimes it's doing things that I like to do, whether that be, you know, going shopping or getting my nails done or just completely doing nothing just sitting around and watching movies and relaxing and just kind of coming back to myself for that day. But so recently I've been getting some pain in my left thumb. And, you know, as much as I tell myself, oh yeah, I got to get the reps in. I'm working on something in my swing before I head to Florida, yada, yada, yada. I've had to force myself the last five days to basically not hit any shots. Or if I do hit shots when it feels better, only 30 to 50 balls max for the day. And then the rest would be focused on other areas of the game, like putting and short game. But it's really difficult not to. Because you kind of get the – once for me, once I kind of hit like day two or three of not touching a golf club, I get a little antsy. And I just want to get right back to it. So I would say, you know, the biggest break I had was COVID. Because even when we go into off season, typically you'll see players, they take off anywhere between like a week to a month you know, whatever they feel they need to kind of reset. I usually only take a week off and then I get right back to it. Because, you know, off season, yes, it's off season. But it's also the time when you make all your adjustments, you get your, you know, gains in the gym. So it's not really off season. You're working just as hard, if not harder. Do you feel a big difference if you don't get to swing as far as your shot where you feel it's actually affecting you or, or after so much rep, can you afford to take, let's say, even a week off? Yeah, I think there's a balance because but, but I kind of have to step back and think to myself, okay, my, you know, my thumb has been really sore. I know it's from overuse. I know it's tendonitis and maybe a little bit of technical things in the swing. But, well, you got to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. If I take this one week off or these five days off, is that really going to affect me that much as opposed to, you know, being in the middle of my tournament in Florida and all of a sudden this starts getting really sore and I have to withdraw? Or I have to play through it and get an even worse injury. So I think it's just kind of balancing those things to figure out what you know what works. I know you mentioned with weather and everything, season kind of is changing. So are you currently in a season right now or just preparing yeah. for one? So we were actually supposed to – I was actually supposed to be in Florida uh, right now. But due to the hurricane, they pushed back stage two of qualifying school one month. So it moved from October to November now. So that gives you more time to heal? couple more weeks to heal you know kind of reset work on things that i need to okay and then what 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 is the goal for that tournament so for that tournament there's three stages and there's two ways to get your tour card you can either go through the regular season right and you finish top 10 you get your card automatically or if you finish 11 through 35 you go straight to stage three um or there's q school which is the second way to get your card stage one stage two and stage three and you have to pass each stage in order to get to final stage stage three but it gets more difficult at each stage so you know i went back and i played stage one as a backup this year you know breeze through it as usual i think i finished like six out of 300 400 girls so first, you know, for me, stage one is like, okay, I shouldn't even be here. I'm just playing through it as a backup. So now we're looking at stage two. And stage two is a little bit more difficult. Um, we're probably going to have about 200, 220 players, and they take only 30 to 45 okay. to move on to the next stage. So the, that would be the goal. Get into that top 30 to 45 and make it to final stage. And for and when you get to final stage, it is a two-week-long process, but then you have a chance to get your LPGA card from there. Is that the the main goal right there to make it? Yes, that has been my focus. So I actually withdrew from the last four tournaments of the season because I felt that there was no need to play in them. I'd rather spend my time, you know, making a couple tweaks in my swing and focusing on stage two. So that's what I did. But we also didn't realize, you know, that it was going to be pushed back another month. But totally fine. I think I feel a lot more refreshed. Everything feels tighter and I'm ready to go. And that'll end uh, this year or th will yes. it carry you? Okay. Yeah. So stage one is usually August, stage two, October, but now November. And then stage three follows literally like a week after that. So that's just going to keep you busy right through the holidays and pretty, yeah, pretty much. much up until Christmas. And then we can go into off season. <laughs> and then you, you start back up in March. So do you take a little bit of time in the holidays to enjoy the extra holiday meals? Oh yeah, of course. You got to live a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. 
yeah, family time. Um, if I take a trip here or there with my family, you know, that's something that I like to do too. Um, but then they also understand, you know, I have to maintain certain things. So, you know, I've been doing it since 12. They get it. <laughs> And then I, on your Instagram, I saw that you are like a, a mixture of, I, I know you mentioned Hawaiian, but I thought I read a, a few different other, yes. uh, <laughs> did you take a sort of DNA test to figure that out or? No, I just know that uh, from talking to my mom and obviously asking what she was and my dad and we kind of put it together. So we have a very blended family. I'm Chinese, Hawaiian, Polish, Hungarian, and Tahitian mixed together. And it's funny because I get this question all the time. You know, at tournaments or even just like walking around in person, you know, people will come up and be like, so, uh, what, what mix are you? <laughs> I'm used to it at this point. But yeah, it's what we call a mixed plate in Hawaii. A very diverse family tree. What about, uh, music? Is music a big part for you working out or... Is I never oh, yeah. see golfers listen to music while they're doing the golf swings or anything like that. Is, is that something that would just interfere? So working out, music is fine. If you need to dig deep and kind of get to that point, then yes, I'm, I'm a music person. If I go to the gym and I don't have my earphones, it's just like, oh, it's going to be a you know one of those workouts. So yeah, music when working out. But for golf, so I've actually done mental training um, for golf, and there's kind of this big debate between – should you be listening to music or should you not? For me, I'm kind of in the middle. I can see the benefits and, you know, the, the good and bad of both sides. I think when you are practicing and you need to be extremely focused, you know, the earbuds need to come out and you need to mimic everything like you would in a tournament. But then at the same time, if I'm trying to get, you know, reps done on the range and it's kind of like a repetitive motion, you know, music kind of helps it go by a little bit faster. But everyone's kind of different. You'll see people, you know, warming up before tournaments with earbuds in and some people aren't. So I think it's just finding what works for you. But during an actual tournament, is that even legal or no? When you're warming up, you can. But on Just the warming up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then since you're traveling, do you do you miss a lot of holidays? Like do you even, growing up in Hawaii, I don't know, was, was Halloween popular there? Yes. Yes, it was. It was, and I, you know, I tell people this all the time. That's why people think I'm more mature than I actually am. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm 26 now, but, you know, I have the maturity of like a 30-something-year-old. And part of the reason why is because as a professional athlete, and especially in golf, you cannot do the normal things that people your age do. And I'm sure that goes for anyone that's striving to do something. But especially, you know, professional sports, you know, I can't just go out and party Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I can't just go out and take a random trip to Disneyland in the middle of the season. You know, I got to go back and see my coach. I got to make this tweak. I got to go work on this. I have to go see the, you know, it's, it's a very different lifestyle. And it's not, there's nothing wrong with it. I've, I've seen girls that, you know, they play a third of the season and they just, they're like, I'm done. I don't like this lifestyle. This is not what I wanted. And then you see girls that have been doing this for 10, 15 years. So I think reality kind of hits after once you turn pro and you see the actual lifestyle, the glamorous aspects of it are great, but then there's so much behind the scenes grind that people don't realize for the sport. And, you know, sports in general, it takes a wear on your body and, you know, the mental aspect too, because there's obviously challenges and adversities and everybody hits a breaking point and rock bottom multiple times in their career and their life. And it's just part of the process. So... I know. I agree. It's definitely part of the process. And uh, for anyone in the audience, if they want to follow Brittany fans, social media, you could click on the fortune cookie, have her Instagram, her Twitter on there. And then there's people who just listen. If anybody wanted to follow along, how could they follow your golfing adventures? Um, Instagram, Facebook. And, you know, I try to respond to people as much as I can on Instagram. It is a little bit challenging with my schedule, but I know that, you know, whether they want to reach out to ask questions about the golf swing or golf tips or workouts or just to say hi, I really do try. Or even if they show up at tournaments, even better. I love that. I love engaging with, um, you know, supporters and fans because you really wouldn't be anywhere without them. And in the end, people just like to see good golf and just get to know you as a person. And that's that's great. Yeah, I, I always find the golf fan pretty fascinating myself because if I go to an event, I want to yell. So I don't, I'd be the guy who gets kicked out for, yeah. Oh, I, I'm, I can't yell yet or, or I can't cheer yet or I can't 
you know, be more loud. They, they all wait till after the swing and then they start clapping. And I watch a lot of like fights. So UFC and they're I actually saw, it was pretty funny today. It was a, it was a meme and they, they switched the, the audience or the, the announcers to golf games and they added it to MMA fights. And then they switched the audio from golfing to, I mean, from MMA fights to golfing and quite, you, it's quite the difference, but it, I probably watched it like 10 times today. It was funny to me. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Golf is unique. And now they've got that new tour that came in. That's kind of stirring things up, creating a lot of drama. So we will see what happens to the golf world in the next couple of years. And well, what is uh, that one you're referring to? So there's a tour called Live Tour, which kind of came in and there's been a lot of controversy. You'll see it all over social media if you Google it whatnot. But people are, it seems, you know, you've got the people that weigh heavy on the PGA side, people that weigh heavy on the Live side, and people that are kind of in, you know, neutral, staying in the middle. But basically it's a tour that's come in and they're backed by Saudi money. And Oh, you know, yeah, I have heard about that, yeah. Uh -huh. have, okay, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of been, it's just been interesting to watch things play out. Yeah. I hear the Saudis are investing a lot of money into the golf game, trying to lure a lot of the pros from United States over there to play. Yeah. But the thing is the tournaments aren't even in Saudi. The tournaments are in the U S and there's a couple international events as well. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> I think they're actually in talks with the women's tour, if I'm not mistaken. But like I said, I guess we'll see how it plays out in the next couple of years. Then I also wanted to know, I'm sure you have some sponsors, any sponsors or people you want to shout out? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a little bit biased. I absolutely love Callaway. I've been pl playing Callaway since I started at 12, but their equipment, it is amazing. And then the shoe company, actually, that I just started working with, I'd say about two years now, it is a golf shoe. So they started out in baseball, but they also moved over into golf. So this shoe company, it's called Athlons. They have 19 patents on their shoe. And the reason for that is because their shoe is completely based on functionality first, de design second. And so it's USGA legal. You can wear them in tournaments. Um, and it basically increases power and stability by 9%. And so for me, that was really cool to see a company that was so focused on the performance of the shoe. Because normally you'll see a bunch of other companies where it's like, oh yeah, these designs are cool and all that. Yeah, I get that aspect. But to actually have a shoe that can help, because golf is already so hard, let's not make it harder. But if you can have a shoe that you know stabilizes and increases power for you, why not use it, right? It's something that you can control. So you know, I've been working with them for two years now and the people that work there are awesome. You know, their mission behind everything. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, the shoes and no one's trying to ban those shoes. People always like, oh, that's some sort of edge or unfair advantage. I know in running, they came out with, I forget, the Nike something. And they're supposed to give you just like a half a second, a little bit more faster. And they're banning them on for major competitors. Uh, yeah. Have you seen that with the golf shoes since you said most are made kind of for fashion? You know, I don't know if people actually understand because usually the typical reaction with the shoes are like, oh, that's got to be a hoax or, oh, you know, that's garbage. It doesn't actually help. But if people would actually just look into the shoe and see that it's backed by science and physics and there's a bunch of long drivers using it and all that kind of stuff, you know, it maybe might open their mind a little bit. Um, and then, of course, you know, I've got sparms for my UV gear because we're in the sun all the time. Need that protection. Go to Caddy Yardage Books. They make these awesome and custom order. You know, you can change the texture, put your logo on it, make the name on it. So I play with them um, at every tournament for my yardage book covers. But yeah. <laughs> well, I want to uh, thank you once again, Brittany, for taking the time out of your day to join us. Always looking forward to seeing you grow and win some championships. And anybody that I have on here, always invite them back. Just so we can see your progression. And then also you, I always expect people to come back and win championships so they can come back with a trophy or something and be like, look, this is what I earned. And I know just by people hearing your story, you, it's funny when you see um, people like sports stars or when you're younger and then as you get older, you're like, oh, this person influenced me. So I know you're influencing young ladies and young men for the positive, because I know a lot of people may not even consider, oh, could I become a pro golfer? Just depending on where you live and 
you know, maybe it's not as popular like how you said in Hawaii it was big, but that's something that they end up liking and never even thought about, hey, there's a there's an option for me to play golf. Yes. And, you know, golf is one of those sports that you can play at two or 90. So, you know, something, you know, I don't I don't know any of this, any other sport that you could play at the age of 80 or 90. And that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Pretty much all my friends that I know play golf. They they involve drinking with it. So I don't know if it's still considered real golf, but yeah. uh, I, I've only done it a few times. I enjoy miniature golf. That's what I really enjoy. But once yeah. again, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, this is Athletic Definition. Brittany Fan. you can follow her on her social media and under B Fan or on, on Facebook. It's the only place where you're Brittany Fan Fan. Yes. Somebody took the other name. So I had to take Brittany Fan Fan. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Everyone have a great weekend. Till next time.